sir um, yeah yeah we are now live on facebook thank you ma'am uh mathis sir so uh, should we begin with the introduction and then after you could take it over yeah that's good with me sir okay sir thank you yes ma'am uh, yeah. we can be um good evening welcome everyone to today's session uh, hosted by ila sonipat chapter before we begin uh, i'll quickly introduce indian lawyers association to all of you uh, ila is a pan india level organization that works for uh, all the legal professionals in the country we we uh, necessarily provide a platform for them uh, for education networking sharing information thoughts um, sharing new updates um uh, networking and we have a few initiatives like the legal aid committee or um few very active initiatives for students where young young lawyers as well as students are mentored and guided wherever they require so we work uh, we work on a model of having chapters all over the country which uh, actually bring in a lot of local flavor to ila operations so here is a list of ila chapters if you belong to any of the cities uh, here uh, please please come forward to join the chapter in your city and if the city is not listed here please reach out to us and we'll be happy to start the city in your chapter so with this i'll hand it over to uh, sania ji president of ila sonipat chapter who has been a very active uh, leader in ila uh, as a new new newly formed chapter sania ji over to you thank you ma'am uh, so as ma'am said we have our chapters in uh, different cities and i'm the president of uh, ila sonipat chapter so far we have had uh, multiple events for the benefit of law students and admissions as well as practitioners and we have had uh, speakers speaking on topics uh, from the field of ip law as well as general fields as well so because we had so much exposure uh, to the field of ip law we decided to actually formulate an ip law committee and uh, with the help of the president of uh, ip law committee uh, who has also joined us in this meeting ms hafza sheikh who is a fifth year student in sndt women's Univers university law school and pursuing her bba llb we were able to form a uh, form and the ip law committee which is uh, the first uh, law committee in our uh, ila sonipat uh, chapter and we also look forward to formulating more such committees and i'm sorry yeah i would but i was on mute we have one of our mentors uh, with us who will be addressing um, a very important issue which is the topic of today's um, and uh, uh, with this i hand over the this first very first event of our ip law committee to uh, mr matthews who is uh, also one of our mentors in the ip law committee over to you sir Uh, thank you, Sonia and uh, Hafsa, for this wonderful opportunity, uh, and to ILA Sonipat as well. Congratulations on the uh, setting up of your IP committee. Uh, it's a really wonderful uh, initiative, and I hope uh, that it will bear a lot of fruit in the years to come. So, uh, without further ado, let's start on our topic for today, uh, which is. sorry uh, which is basically on the uh, madrid protocol or the international applications which are filed by what you of the uh, madrid protocol uh, hafsa uh, sanya could sir uh, please give me rights to share the screen please uh, yes sir um just uh, ma'am could you please uh, change the setting so that sir could share the screen so in the meantime uh that they get my settings up and running uh let's kind of touch upon what exactly we are dealing with today so um in the past companies found it very expensive to file trademark applications and maintain them in numerous numerous countries across the world 
So let's say company A wanted to have an international presence in let's say 100 countries. He or she, or they would have to maintain 100 different applications for just one brand. And there could be multiple trademarks, which would then further accentuate their problem. And also have the logistical power to be able to maintain them, track them, you know, deal with the problems, deal with the renewals and so on and so forth. So it was quite a task to be, to, you know, keep a uh, maintenance of all of this data for any one person sitting in house. And additionally, you're also looking at huge costs. Imagine filing applications in hundred countries, filing renewals in hundred countries and the cost that one would have to bear for the same. So that is where the entire system changed and we have this wonderful new platform which came about called the Madrid system. Now the Madrid system consists of a huge number of things that we will now touch upon as in go through the slides. Um, firstly, it's a, like I was stating, it's a convenient and cost-effective solution for registering and managing trademarks worldwide. Imagine having just one trademark application in all of these 100 countries instead of 100 trademark application. The Madrid system, as we have it today, consists of a couple of things. One, it's the it is a guide to the international registration of marks. Second, it consists of the common regulations. Third, it consists of a Madrid agreement. And fourth, it consists of the Madrid protocol. So we will go into each of these subtopics during the course of our session today. The Madrid system consists, of, like I said, of the Madrid Agreement, the Madrid Protocol, the Common Regulations, and the Guide to the International Registration of Marks. The Madrid Agreement and Madrid Protocols is what we will deal first, and then we will move on to the Common Regulations and the International Registration of, the Guide to the International Registration of Marks. The Madrid Agreement came about in the year 1891. It was enacted to bring about a single inexpensive process for the registration of trademarks globally. Just minutes ago, I touched upon the costs that one would have to incur if one filed in 100 different countries. So you had an agreement in, signed in Madrid, obviously, which came about, which stated that you could file a single application across the globe. It eliminated the need for filing separate applications. It eliminated the need for maintenance of separate applications. So I would have one application number, a single application across 100 different countries. However, the Madrid agreement suffered from certain, certain defects and a lot of countries never acceded to the agreement. The minute you have a number of countries not acceding to an, the, to an agreement or a protocol or a treaty, after a while it fails. And that is what happened with the Madrid Agreement. It failed due to certain defects which was there within the agreement. In stepped in the Madrid Protocol in 1989 to, in a way, remedy the effects of the Madrid Agreement. The Madrid Protocol, like I stated, enacted to remedy the perceived deficiencies within the Madrid Agreement. It was more flexible and accommodating than the agreement. And a total of 106 countries are currently parties to the protocol and it continues to increase with new, new signatories coming on. India is a signatory to the Madrid Protocol. So this is something that we need to understand. We will deal with India separately as a separate set further on. Now coming to the common regulations and the guide to the international registration of marks. The common regulations contain a set of 41 rules regarding the process and procedure of filing an international application under the Madrid system. So the common regulations have to be read along with either the Madrid agreement or the Madrid protocol, which will one we go with. In India, it's the Madrid protocol that we go with. So you need, if you're looking to file a Madrid application, why the Madrid agreement? Uh, protocol, you need to also look into the common regulations, which are equivalent to the rules that we have for every trademark. Or rather, like if you take the Trademark Act, you have the trademark rules, which work side by side. By side. Similarly, you have the matter protocol and you have the common regulations. Then you have another document known as the Guide to the International Registration of Marks. Now, the Guide to the International Registration of Marks is basically intended for applicants and holders, as well as officials of member states of the Madrid Union. 
it basically is educative literature which gives the official the good idea of how to proceed with filing and the procedure for the processing of an application filed through this route. It explains the essential provisions, the matter agreement, the matter protocol, and the common regulation. So, it, like I stated, it is more educative in nature, and it is good for trademark officials to have it as a Bible to kind of guide them through the process of registering such a mark, which comes through such kind of a protocol or a agreement. So these are the four main documents that one needs to look at or one needs to lean upon when one is filing a mandate application. What is the difference then between the mandate agreement and protocol? I said that the mandate protocol came about due to deficiencies in the mandate agreement, but there, there were other differences as well. So let's understand the differences and then proceed on to where India is currently at. The mandate agreement is the first one that we will deal with and side by side I'll deal with the magic protocol as well. The agreement can only be filed on the basic the basis of a basic registration. The change in the magic protocol which came about was that one could file an application on the basis of a basic registration or an application. The agreement stated that only if one had a registration could one file by virtue of the Madrid agreement. The protocol changed this. The Madrid protocol changed this and said that if you had an application pending in your country, you could still designate countries outside India and you know be a filer uh, application through this particular route. The trademark offices in the designated countries as per the agreement had to raise an objection within 12 months. Countries felt that 12 months was sometimes too less different countries have different rules, different timelines, different speed at which they process applications. The protocol gave countries the option of either adopting a 12 month time period or an 18 month time period to raise objections. India, which is signatory to the protocol, has adopted an 18 month time period. In the agreement, the time of registration or the term of registration was for a time period of 20 years. Countries across the world are almost similar when it comes to the time period or term of registration for a trademark. It is by and large 10 years. In certain countries nowadays, it is seven years. But by and large, it is 10 years. The matter protocol has accepted this 10 year time period and the countries who are signatories the same are happy with it because it confers with their local rules and norms. The matter agreement stated that all applications had to be filed in the French language. Now, this created a problem because if you are coming from an English speaking country or in any other country with a language apart from French, you had to have it translated into French, which added on to your costs. The matter protocol stated that applications could be filed in either French, Spanish or English, thus giving them a larger choice of which language it could be filed in. Now, most of the languages outside India, you could you will find French, Spanish, and English being spoken. Therefore, this was a much easier process as far as language is concerned for countries to adopt. The matter agreement also stated that there was no option for transformation to a national application if the basic registration ceases to exist. I use the word transformation. So let's understand what transformation is before I state the next 10 sentence. Transformation is basically if you have, let's say you filed uh, application through the matter agreement or the protocol, and due to some reason, the application is threatened to be canceled. What do you do then? The process of a transformation then comes to your assistance wherein you're able to transform it from an international application into a domestic application within that particular country. The Madrid Protocol gave that option of transformation into a national application, which was not there in the Madrid Agreement. So this again proved to be beneficial to the signatories. So this was by and large the basic differences between the Madrid Agreement and the Madrid Protocol. <clears throat> Moving forward, we need to understand the procedure for you know, filing an application such as this. The procedure I would state falls in three different stages. The first stage is from the office of origin. The second stage is at the World Intellectual Property Organization. And the third is at the office of the designated party. Now at the office of origin, one basically files a basic 
application okay subsequent to filing the basic application one extends it to via the mandarin application to various countries so you so if it's india you file your basic application you have that file subsequently you use that same application number put it into a form known as form mm2e and then you submit it online which goes to the international bureau uh, rather before it goes to the international bureau it's verified by the office of origin so the indian trademark registry will verify it for formalities and then subsequently forward it to the world intellectual property organization and that is where stage 2 comes into play in stage 2 the international bureau which is equivalent to the, let's say the trademark registry at the indian trademark office would then examine the application which they have received from the office of origin for formalities such as has the fees been paid has sufficient fee be pay, paid is it equivalent or similar to the basic application are all the particulars in order and so on and so forth if any particular formality is not been complied with they would raise an irregularity notice which would then be conveyed back to the office of origin and the office of origin conveyed to the applicant let's say there is no irregularity notice the international bureau would then continue to publish that particular mark in the gazette which is equivalent to the trademark journal and then subsequently issue a certificate of registration this does not mean that the mark stands as registered in let's say the united states or uk which were country we have designated in stage 1 it only states that the internet Inter international bureau has found the application to be order in order and issued a certificate stating that it is in order so the certificate of registration which they issue is technically not one which ratifies that it has been registered in x y and z countries then we go to stage 3 once it has been ratified by the world intellectual property organization that it is in order it is then forwarded to the designated countries now the designated countries are chosen at the time of filing the mandate application so it goes to x y and z countries who would then examine it under their particular laws if there is an objection should to be raised it would raise it by way of a provisional refusal which is then conveyed to wipo who would then convey it to the office of origin or to the applicant let's say there is no provisional refusal which is issued uh, then the mark, mark is then published in the respective trademark journals and a statement of grant of protection is issued if there is a provisional refusal which comes about a response needs to be filed and this is the stage where you as an attorney needs to approach an associate in another country because you can't sitting in india file a response to the provisional refusal of objections which have been raised by the uspto the uk ip or any of the other trademark offices across the world only an attorney who is local in nature who is authorized to practice in that particular jurisdiction can file a response to the provisional refusal however all of these stages till you reach stage 3 you are not in touch with any foreign associate thus saving costs for your applicant at the end of the day and this was one of the advantages of the matrix protocol that we will see later on so this is a, dim a picture graphic representation of what i just said you file the basic application it goes to the office of origin from the office of origin it goes to the world intellectual property organization in stage 2 which then forwards it to the office of the designated contracting party who then examines it it's under their respective laws within a time period of 12 or 18 months which over one they have chosen and then subsequently issues a statement of grant of protection now protecting and processing of international applications in india now this is divided you could say into two uh, res respective stages one is applications which originate from india and the second is applications which have been filed designating india so we will go into each of these the first phase of it which originates from india is known as iaoi or international applications originating out of india before that as a precursor let's understand what the act of the rules state in respect of the madrid protocol which india has been a signatory to so india acceded to the madrid protocol in july 8 2013 and as a contracting party the trademark registry has a twofold responsibility like i just stated one is access of office of origin of international applications originating from india 
and secondly it acts as a designating contracting party for international registrations designating india so one is known as iaoi applications and the second one is known as irbi application the trademarks act had to be amended to include these uh, sections regarding the ascension to the madrid protocol so we had a new chapter being in put in namely chapter 4a which contains sections 36a to 36g which deal with such applications under the madrid protocol in 2017 when the rules came about chapter 4 was again included with rule 62 to 74 which deals with international applications which corresponds to section 36a and section 36g of the trademarks act 1999 we also had section 36a e4 which provides a provision of section 921 shall apply to international applications as well so these sections are applicable to international applications over and above the uh, chapter 4 which i have mentioned earlier so this is something that one needs to keep in mind as well for any application out originating from outside india it has to comply with indian law for it to be valid and that is where section 36e4 comes into the picture now looking at iaui and irdi applications we start off with indian international applications originating in india and go on to the irdi portions of it so once the application is filed the trademarks registry has a very simple process it has to verify the application so you pay a fee of 5000 rupees which is what is known as a handling fee to the trademarks registration to do all of these tasks which i have put on to your screen today the trademark registry verifies the application it checks whether the goods and services are in order whether it is the same classes which have been applied for as a basic application whether the fees have been paid and so on and so forth if any deficiencies are there it issues a deficiency letter and the applicant is required to remedy the same within one month once let's say a deficiency letter is issued you have to file a response let's say the response is satisfactory it moves to the next stage that certificate and trans uh, transmission so if the application is found to be in order and if any deficiency has been remedied the application is certified and transmitted to the world intellectual property organization if let's say the uh, wipo issues an irregularity letter during their examination the same is then sent to the trademark registry which then has to send it across to the applicant and the irregularity is usually rectified through the office of origin within a time period of 3 months so you have a time period of 3 months if the wipo raises any objections <clears throat> additionally the trademark registry also has the duty of communicating of the seizing of effect of any basic application let's say due to some particular in a uh, problem the basic application is cancelled before the expiry of 5 years from date of the international application the trademark registry is then obligated to communicate the same to the world intellectual uh, 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 property organization which would then affect the international application so this 5 year time period is very very important in the uh life of an international application because if the basic application is affected within that 5 years from the date of filing then the international application is also subsequently affected that is where instances of transformation would come into play if required so these are the basic duties of the indian trademark registry as far as an indian application international application originating out of india is concerned now on the reverse let's say it's an international registration designating india or so an applicant has filed an application in another country and india has been designated what is the role of the trademark registry at that particular point of time the first is obviously examinations and issuances of provisional refusals now provisional refusals is another terminology for what we know as examination reports of the indian trademark registry so the trademark registry of the tmr shall examine the international applications under section 9 and 11 which is basically the sections regarding distinctiveness and also sections regarding a prior registration or an application on existence on the trademark register if there is an objection that they feel needs to be raised the same will be raised by way of a provisional refusal but the same has to be done within a time period of 18 months in the initial slides i had stated that you had a time period of either 12 months or 18 months depending on the jurisdiction that you are designating to 
and whatever they have accepted for raising any objections. India has taken an 18 month time period. Therefore, any objections has to be raised by way of a provisional refusal within a time period of 18 months. Subsequently, let's see the response is filed. A hearing can also be held by the Indian Trademark Registry for such kind of situations. The hearings are held currently in Mumbai. Um, now with the virtual platforms, it is held online as well. The second duty that the Indian Trademark Registry has is in the publication in the Trademarks Journal. If no provisional refusal is issued, or let's say a satisfactory response is issued or subsequent to a hearing, the matter is accepted. The IRDI application is then accepted for registration in the Trademarks Journal and is published in a separate part of the Trademarks Journal. So it's published just like any other mark would be if filed domestically in the Trademarks Journal every Monday. Notices of opposition can also be issued. So once it's published in the Trademark Journal, the IRDI application also has a four month statutory time period in which any interested third party may file an opposition against it. So if an opposition is filed, the processing of this notice of opposition is also done by the Trademarks Registry exactly as it would be in a domestic application. Lastly, any changes to name, amendments, limitations, cancellations, or renewals are also undertaken and processed by the Indian Trademarks Registry in respect of an international registration designating India. So these are the tasks that the Indian Trademark Registry has when it comes to an IRDI application as well. The system that is there, which I've elaborated to you, has its pros and has its cons as well. Before we conclude, we need to understand what are the advantages and what are the disadvantages, because there isn't a system without an advantage or a disadvantage. The advantages of pros are basically, it is a very, very cost-effective system. It saves you a huge amount of money. Imagine having 100 different associates to send your correspondence to and incurring costs of 100 different associates. Here you have only a single application with a single cost for 100 different countries. This is maybe the most cost effective way that an applicant could extend his application across the world to many countries. We often come across clients who balk at the fee, professional fee when it is raised in respect of different countries. They wish to expand, but they don't want to because of cost concerns. This takes it off the table and ensures that you have a cost effective system which anybody can avail of much higher and much cheaper than the prior system which was there. Secondly, it's very convenient. You only need to file a single application. You don't need to file 100 different applications. You don't need to speak to 100 different associates. You don't need to look into 100 different requirements. It is a single window, a single system, which is very, very convenient where anyone can file a an application. Thirdly, it is a centralized filing procedure. Therefore, you don't have to look at the procedure of filing for 100 different countries. The laws of every country is different, but through the matter protocol, one is able to file a single application in a very cost effective and convenient manner and in a very fast manner as well. Lastly, logistics are a heavy concern. If you had 100 different applications dates, 100 different registration dates, 100 different renewal dates, all to monitor, your task would definitely be a huge one. With one expiry date and one renewal request to be filed, even your renewals are much more cost effective and easy both to monitor and to maintain. The system has its disadvantages or cons as well. The biggest disadvantage is the hearings. All hearings are held at the Mumbai Trademarks Registry. Earlier, when we did not have the virtual platform to do hearings, we had to travel to Mumbai or have someone there appear for you at the hearings which were held at the Bombay Trademark Registry. Though we have registries spread out across the country, five of them in all, including Mumbai, the registries were held at the headquarters of the Trademark Registry based out of Mumbai. Stakeholders have long asked for hearings to be held at different registries, but till date, the requests have been denied. Secondly, division applications cannot be filed. In a domestic application for a multi-class application, you are in a position to file a division application if called upon to do so. However, the same cannot be said to be done in a matter application. This proves to be disadvantages to stake or to applicants, especially when the requirement is to file it if called upon to do so. 
thirdly, priority. Unlike other countries, India, only a single priority can be claimed in respect of goods and services. So in a single application, even if, even if it may be multi-class in nature, you can only have a single priority. So if you have priority applications stretching on different classes, you will need to file separate applications to claim priority. Lastly, transformation. There is no procedure or form provider for transformation of an international application to a domestic application in India. Though the rules have agreed to the same, though the sections are there which allows it, the process or procedure is not there for the same to date for us to be able to take advantage of this. Stakeholders, again, like the division application, have put forth a lot of arguments, a lot of requests for the same to be imbibed into our system. Time will tell if these deficiencies are rectified. All in all, the Madrid protocol nutshell is quite an effective system for all of us to avail of. Uh, a lot of times we have clients who come to us who wish to, you know, take advantage of systems of, uh, and to expand their businesses and trademarks across the world. Costs always prove to be a hindrance for each of them. Uh, but hopefully uh, in the future, if you utilize the system to the full extent, you will find that it proves to be very beneficial for all and sundry, especially for your clients when they wish to expand their business. The world is no longer, um, you know, just a very hard and hard fast within the territories that we work in companies, businesses, they are always expanding. So understanding the system, learning about the system and actually helping clients file their applications through the system is something that we need to be well aware of as lawyers. And uh, hopefully we shall do so in the future as well. Uh, Sanya, over to you. Thank you so much sir, for that uh, very concise and very informative uh, presentation. So uh, before the participants have any questions, you could also drop in your uh, queries in the chat box. But meanwhile, I had a question, if I may. Uh, so uh, the, the system also has, uh, if, let's talk about the procedural aspect, like the practical aspects. So the system also has a monitor. So we have the Madrid monitor. How effective is it to track the application status? I'm sure you might have also um, seen how effective it is. Um, that, so that also might help people to understand whether or not it's actually as effective as, as it promises to be. So the Madrid monitor is quite effective. Um... The once the application goes from the Indian trademark, so I'll, I'll speak it from the Indian trademark registry side. So once it goes from the Indian trademark registry to the International Bureau, the international registration number is issued and the uh, system starts reflecting, the market monitor starts reflecting the number. All the documents across various jurisdictions also start popping up within the Madrid monitor. So technically, if you go to the Madrid monitor today for an application which has already been filed, okay, you can in a way see all the countries that particular mark has been designated to, all the documents pertaining to that particular country. And there's also a real-time status tracker, which basically ensures that you, you get to see in real time what is happening in this particular country as well. So it's it's quite effective. It's, it's quite a nice system. Uh, if you haven't looked into it, do look into it. Put any major brand out there in the world today, and you can pretty much see what the system can throw out. Uh, you can even actually look at it uh, from the perspective of, let's say, I, I can do an advanced search within the Madrid monitor and kind of filter it by way of law firms as well. So I could check today for my clients what all marks have been filed uh, on the reverse uh, by them in India, designating India. So I could check that as well for them. Okay, so that means it's uh, very very intense as well as interactive kind of uh, forum. So um, speaking of career wise, so because it's too, so detailed, so uh, could you suggest how uh, the law school graduates or um, people who have worked in law firms could also apply uh, to work in that area? For example, um, say website, uh, management or also just managing the database in the Madrid um, monitor that would also be helpful. 
Uh, so I don't exactly know how you get a job in matter at the matter monitor, but I believe you will have to maybe apply to the world intellectual property organization and be accepted by them. Uh, and I'm assuming they have different departments that one could possibly avail of maybe the Madrid uh, monitor system and the back end of it is one of it. So uh, that's the only way you could possibly get a job at the World Intellectual Property Organization. You will have to apply to them. There is no way in which you can go to the Indian Trademark Registry and ask them to forward your resume to them. That that's not possible. Okay. If you want a job with the uh, World Intellectual Property Organization, you've got to apply to them. I do believe that on their website there is a system, there is a listing of jobs which do come up or vacancies which do come up. Uh, at the various world intellectual property organizations across the world. So it, it's not only in Geneva. They, I think they have a, a headquarters in Singapore as well, if I'm not mistaken today. So even in Singapore and other jurisdictions where they do have bases, jobs and vacancies are listed for various posts. And that post not only includes uh, legal positions, but it also includes positions, like you said, in the back end of things for various other posts as well, like, you know, even, even in respect of IT and so on and so forth. Okay, so that was that might be really helpful for some of the students as well who have joined as participants. Some of them have reached uh, to us asking, so how do we go for a job at WIPO? That's uh, something that they haven't still figured out. So thank you a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for that advice. Uh, participants, if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself or you could also maybe type out um, uh, your query in the chat. So, Sanya, just to uh, give you give your participants also who have asked you this query, if you type WIPO job vacancies in Google, it actually throws up a, a link to the same. You know, that's the easiest way to actually access that particular site that I was saying. So just type WIPO job vacancies and you pretty much get it. Thanks a lot. That was very exact. And uh, I'm sure uh, the participants as well and the people who are watching us live on Facebook will also find this uh, useful. Uh, so anyone, if you have any questions, any queries, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself. Or alternatively, you could also type it out in the chat box, any queries that you have. So in the meanwhile, I uh, had another comparative query. For example, the world before this Madrid um, application system and the world after the Madrid application system. So you talked about cost effectiveness. That's one of the major factors, one of the major contributions, as you said, that this filing system uh, has provided, as well as the consolidated uh, one-step forum that it provides. Uh, could you also for us uh, tell us what uh, what was the world before the system as well as after the Madrid pro protocol? Why exactly was the, there a need for this protocol? So the system before this was quite expensive and time consuming and logistically a nightmare. Um, just think of this. Uh, you have a client who wants to expand their business abroad. The first hurdle is obviously costs. Okay, The minute you give them costs for 100 countries, they balk at the figure and they don't want to go it. From 100, you come down to 50, maybe if you're lucky. If you are unlucky, you will be at one, okay? The Madrid system takes care of that because it reduces the cost substantially. There is no concept of double billing which comes about. So if you approach a foreign associate, they would raise their invoice. Subsequently, you would raise yours as well. And the client would get a consolidated invoice of a huge amount, okay? and multiply this into 100 different associates. Okay, so you're looking at a huge cost. Secondly, co uh, coordinating and filing across 100 different countries is not an easy task. It's, it's quite a difficult one, actually. Okay, uh, corresponding with 100 different people, fulfilling 100 different requirements, 100 different powers of attorney, and so on and so forth is quite a tedious task as well the matter protocol takes care of that. It, it eliminates all that. It ensures that you have a single application filed through a single window with just one document, one power of attorney, which you may already have in your possession. It takes care of all that, okay? The third thing is obviously monitoring these 100 applications and also maintaining these 100 applications for expiry dates, renewals, changes of name, assignments, so on and so forth. 
doing an assignment in 100 different countries and coordinating it or doing a renewal in 100 different countries and monitoring and maintaining it is quite, again, a tedious task. Through the MATRA protocol, you have a single window, like I mentioned earlier, to do all of this. Okay, Even though you may or may not have to go through the Office of Origin, you can go directly to the International Bureau and have it filed for all of these jurisdictions. Okay, So a single application filed for, let's say, an assignment which is taking place from party A to party B, all of which can be done with 10 or 15 minutes of time. So you your logistics are taken care of, your costs are taken care of, you have a single window in which you can file everything. And you don't have to maintain so many applications or monitor so many applications. All of these are the advantages. And a world before the matter protocol had all of these disadvantages. Okay, you had to go through all of this. Today, as territory or boundaries break down between countries, businesses are also expanding across the globe. Okay, So you have Indian companies expanding in the United Kingdom or the United States. You have startups wanting to venture out of India or venture out of the territory of India. This system offers them a one-stop window as far as their trademarks are concerned and its protection across the globe at a very, very cost-effective uh, rate, okay? Which was not there prior to this. Prior to this, countries had, or rather companies, only ex companies with a large amount of money could hope to expand and protect their trademarks across India. But this kind of levels the playing field for all and sundry. So uh, does the system only help in registration or is there also a consolidated uh, and cost-effective uh, measure or procedure for uh, listening to disputes which arise in uh, such filing uh, method? So if there is a dispute, you will still need to go to uh, your dispute and the country in which you have a dispute mm -hmm. at. Okay, uh, the costs are saved to a, large, to, to a large extent at the time of filing and its subsequent registration and renewals and changes of name and so on and so forth. But if it is a litigious matter, if it's a contentious matter and one needs to enforce one's right, there is no single system in which you can enforce your right across the globe. The laws of various countries are different. This is something that one needs to understand. Therefore, if you have a contentious matter, you need to be a judge on the basis of the laws within that particular jurisdiction. So in that kind of a situation, you will need to still, you will have to go to a local associate like we do even today or prior to the matter protocol to enforce your rights in those particular countries. So basically, that's not something that has been developed as of yet, but would you uh, uh, suggest that developing something in this regard uh, would also um, have a consolidated forum for uh, dispute resolution, or would that be very impossible to even uh, think of? For having a consolidated dispute resolution mechanism, one would need to bring a huge number of countries on board with a common goal of uh, resolving such kind of uh, disputes. I don't think we are today at the stage where every country would kind of let go of their laws to kind of come to uh, such kind of a forum. Um, that is a little bit of a tough ask, okay? Because the even uh, there is a difference between civil law countries and common law countries as well, as far as how law is enforced. Okay, how trademarks are viewed, the various procedures for the same. So to give you an example, India is supposed to use country, whereas the US is supposed to file country. Okay, prior use is not recognized in the United States. So you can't at the time of filing your application put a date of use. So there are a lot of uh, issues for a contentious matter, which may prove to be a hurdle if you are trying to have a common platform for dispute resolution for intellectual property or trademarks as a whole, uh, or utilizing the matter system for something like that. Sanya, I think I have a question from Robin. Uh, yes. so Robin, is it truly cost effective as the application moves to provisional refusals? Um, the answer to the question, Robin, is yes, it is cost effective. Very simply put, like I stated earlier, if you had to have 100 associates and and each of those 100 associates charge you at the time of filing, 
you would even you wouldn't even reach the stage of provisional refusals or examinations additionally there are a lot of cases where provisional refusals are not issued okay uh it goes directly to publication so you do save costs at the end of the day okay you do save filing costs which is a huge amount okay i'm talking about thousands of dollars robert i'm not talking about 1 rupee or 100 rupees i'm talking about thousands of dollars okay so if you approach 100 countries and each country charges you at 200 uh, dollars that is close to around i don't know uh, 2000 something or 2 lakh dollars that you're looking at which is pretty much saved okay so it's it's not a small amount that you're saving rom it's, it's quite a lot of money okay and at the end of the day your client is looking at the finances when he is filing across the world as well so you will have a client who will come to you and tell you yes i would like to file all across the world the minute you tell him the cost is all across the world comes down to 10 countries this is what eventually happens so cost saving or having a cost effective mechanism and being able to give that cost effective means to your client is as important as providing him a solution as to how to go about filing it thank you so much sir i don't see that we have any other queries in the chat box so uh, here's an announcement for the uh, participants so this event as well as other events which uh, had uh, um, Uh, discussions on ip law related matters will be available uh, and is available on youtube and we are uh, moving towards formulating a separate section on our website which will have all these events so as to form uh, a consolidated um, a resource list for ip law matters uh, and that will be under the ags of ip law committee and uh, anyone uh, if if you if the participants or your friends um, or your acquaintances are interested in the field of intellectual property please do encourage them to join our uh, newly formed committee we will be apart from hosting uh, events we'll also look forward to work intimately with you all um, uh, to make other such uh, events possible and uh, apart from uh, webinars we'll also have uh, other events like uh, um, article uh, writing competitions or some other events uh, special events in this regard um if you don't have any further questions and i can't see any uh, maybe we could uh, conclude this uh, session for today thank you so much sir for this very informative session and this topic that you chose um for today's session is also is very less talked about and i'm very sure the participants as well as people who are watching us live and also the ones who will us uh, look at oh, at the video will also get a one stop um um uh, information on and consolidated information on this uh, topic of midrit filing system uh, which is i'm very sure in the, the students as well will highly benefit from this thank you so much sir for this session today and and thank you participants for joining us and the ones who have joined us live thank you Thank you Sonia thank you Alex cheers